this is going to be an interesting class for a lot of reasons. I know they all are, right? But, but especially this one for one reason, and that is I, I just found out, all right, because I tried to bring up uh, Camtasia again, and it crashed. And I'm thinking, geez, could this be a problem with the operating system that we just put in? Yes. Camtasia is incompatible with OS X Yosemite. But what, what, what they said was, if you downgrade to an earlier version, it'll work. Well, I'm kind of afraid to do that because they promise when you do that, you can upgrade again. But I'm not sure if you can or not. Okay? So, what, what I'm going to end up doing is what you see on the screen right here is the Mac stuff, right? And I have absolutely no idea, as I'm taping this, if that's what's going to end up showing or if th what's on my screen here is going to end up showing. See what I'm saying? Because I didn't test it first. Okay? So I'm just trying it. So you're going to, if nothing else, for the people who've missed today, at a minimum, you're at least going to have audio. Okay? And like I said, we'll go through this. But what I have done is I've gone through, just so you can see what's on here, there are three folders on the folder that I asked you to copy. The first folder says Swift Tutorial Part 1, a quick start. And that's a Word document. The problem is we don't have Word on these machines. So I saved it again as a PDF right underneath it. Hopefully you can see that. So you've got the, the uh, so if I open this, that'll come up, or at least it should come up, because it's just a PDF. All right? Then what's in there is I just, I've got is a copy of the zip file. I gave you this the other day, but I've broken them down into the three tutorials. All right, so this is the zip file for the playground. Then these are the three things that are created in, the, in that first tutorial. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? These are the things that are created in there. I just saved them as text files. So in other words, the first one that's in there, if you, uh, the first one that's in there, I, I don't know what, what editor it even uses to try to open this, but I'm going to try to anyway. There we go. Cool. So there's the first one. That's the tip calculator. And don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to go through any of this stuff on here, so you can see it up on the screen here. All right, I realize that the font is a little small, but you've got it right on, this, on the disk that I gave you. All right? So you've got it there. So that's the first one. That's the first one they ask you to put into the playground. Then the next one, they ask you to go back and change it so that right near the end, so right near the bottom of where we are right here, we are now using an array in here. This function is different, but the rest of it is the same as the first one. Does that make sense? So this, this one is different. Okay? And then lastly, so the last one that's in there is the dictionary. And again, it's similar except again for the fact, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. That closed it, but I'll open it again. Again, that routine has changed to now make it a dictionary. Does all that make sense? All right. So what I'm going to ask, and I'm asking you this because I don't know the answer to what I'm about to ask you. All right. Last time we started to play with the playgrounds, correct? Okay. And to my knowledge, at least, just watching a little bit from what you guys were doing, it appeared as though what you were doing was you just typed in some simple stuff. You might have even made a program or two on your own, but you didn't do these. And is that correct? All right. So what, what I'm going to do, literally take about 10 minutes or so, I want to go over that first tutorial with you. Okay? Then once we get done with that, I'm going to give you some time to work on it. But before we do that, I want to quickly walk through the second tutorial and just show you something that they talk about on there. Does that make sense? All right. So I'm going to go up and have my own playground and try to do this. All right. And basically just you know, make a playground file and put all, these, all three of these in there and see if they work. I haven't even tried them because I did this last hour. All right. But if we look now. All right, 
I'm just going to, all I'm going to do is talk about the stuff that I think matters. First of all, the author mentions in here, and this is an important point. That's why I'm saying it, okay? The author says here, do a file, new file. Do a file, new file, iOS source playground, and click next. I don't recommend you create a playground like that. Remember how I showed you when we did a file, new, new file, or file new, and we went right to playground? You know what I'm talking about? I think that's how you guys did it. That's how I told you to do it. The reason for that is what happens if you do it the way the author shows it here? I tried it three times. What it does is it grabs the last program that you had open, and it, it, it immediately connects the playground to that last program that you had open. So I had the playground, but it was inside of my tip calculator. Do you understand that the one that we did as a class? But when I just did a file, new, playground, it didn't do that. It made it a separate file so I could save it. That's why I'm asking you guys to do the same thing. So what I'm saying is I wouldn't do it the way the author mentions it here on the bottom of this first page. All right. I think by now we all know that if you use the word var like this right there, it's a variable. If you use the word let, it's a constant. I think you all know that. that I think that's hopefully at least that's enough said on that. Do you all understand the difference now, I'm asking you this, between explicit and inferred typing? Do you understand the difference between them? All right, I'm seeing at least one head shaking no. So if we look at this, if you look at the example that's up on the screen right here, the first one is inferred typing because you don't give it a data type. You just say, bless you, let, let or it could be a var in here too, it doesn't matter, but it's got the name equals and then the value. That lets the, the compiler basically figure out the type based on the way you've used it. In the second one, that's explicit typing. It has nothing to do with the word explicit. You could have called this anything you wanted, but it's colon space variable type. When you do that, when you put the variable type in there, you are explicitly telling the system the type. Is there an advantage to doing that? Technically, no. There really isn't. And the author even says down here someplace uh, in, in the tutorial, he says, we recommend that you just use the inferred because it's less typing. And it really doesn't buy you anything to do the explicit. But you know what? If it makes it easier for you to read and understand the program, then you should do it that way. Yes. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And, and even the examples that I just showed you, the ones you know that I, that I went back and I, I used the way that I take code and, and do tabbing and whatever. I did that. It wasn't in there. He didn't do any of that. I did it. Not because I'm all that great, but I did it because I wanted it to look like stuff I've done. That's all. Because I, I want it to be my own comfort level or whatever you want to call it. Remember, we've talked about this before. That if you have an if statement, like what's shown here up on the screen, if on sale inferred, what had comes after an if or a while or a for or a do while, this has to be a Boolean condition. That's why, again, you can say if x equal equal 1, but it won't allow you to say if x equal 1, because that's not a Boolean condition. That's assignment. All right? They call this a type safe language because it is somewhere in between objective C and C. C is an unbelievably strong type language. All right, it's one of the stronger type languages I've ever worked with. Objective C decided to go their own way and said, well, if you got a, uh, an array, you can put anything you want in it. You can put some numbers in, some, some strings, you can put some Booleans, it doesn't matter. You got a, you've got a, uh, a dictionary, you can do the same thing. Now they're going back with, with Swift to the more the C way the stronger typing, where they're saying, no, if it's an array of ints, you can only put ints in there, whether it's inferred or explicit. Boom. OK? And the same thing with a dictionary. So that's what the author was talking about in this section right here. All right, then they came in and they asked you to start creating the class. When you first started to create the class, this was all you had. Class, tip calculator, paren, paren. 
right? That literally is a class. It's not going to do anything. There aren't any variables. There aren't any methods, but it's a class. It's a totally legitimate class right there, all right? Then the author comes in and says, do this. I don't like the fact this is me. This is, I'm not Ray Wenderlich. He knows a hell of a lot more about this than I do. But the point is, I would never have made those lets. I would have made those vars. I don't understand the reason for making those lets. They're constants, right? Yeah. So he's passing values in there, and you can never change those. I don't understand the rationale behind them. Maybe he's got a good one. All right, but one of the first things he does in the next chapter, in the next tutorial, is he said, change both of these to var. It's one of the first things that he does. And then he basically changes this one too. We'll look at that in just a couple minutes. All right, so I would have done it like that to begin with. But again, hey, he might come back and say, you know what, Jeff? You, you said, Jeff, you know what? When you write your own series of tutorials, do it any friggin' way you want. All right? And I could see that. All right? Those are, be, those are all explicitly typed, yes. No, but that's, a, I mean, Mark brings up a really good question. If everybody look up on the screen here, since they're setting those up right now, to my knowledge, you have to explicitly, maybe that's why he did it. I don't know, but you have to explicitly type these because you can't just say let total, because that doesn't make any sense, does it? The system doesn't know what kind of variable total would be holding. You know, I could say let number, and the system doesn't know. Well, it's, it's named number, but it doesn't go by the name of the variable. All right? So what this is doing is this is right there that is explicitly typing three variables that right now, to my knowledge, all have the value of nil, which means unknown. All right? To my knowledge, right now. All right? Then the author comes in and says at the bottom of the page here, now do this. Set up this init. And I've said this to you before. I want to say it again. This is a constructor. Did you all hear that? In other languages, we call this the constructor. All right? Its name is always init. You notice it doesn't have func in front of it. It's init. You can have as many inits as you want, but as always, What's in the parens here, what's in the signature, must be different. So here we were expecting two doubles, right? But if for some reason we could, re we could actually go up and rewrite this with two ints, for example, OK? There's no reason to do that here. And also notice, our variables are called total and tax percentage, right? The ones that we're passing in, we're giving the same name. So if we had done this in Java, that would have to be this dot. But in this language, they don't use the word this. They use the word self. So it's self dot. So this self dot right here, that one, ooh, that self dot that you see right there, that one refers to self dot total refers to that total. This refers to whatever value you passed in. Same kind of thing. That self dot tax percentage, that one refers to that one. And the tax percentage that's here refers to the one that's passed in. You don't need the self here because it doesn't appear on the, other, on the right hand side of the equal sign. You could still put it in. You, it would be totally legit to say self dot subtotal equals total divided by tax percentage plus one in parens. That'd be okay to do. You don't have to, but you could. All right? So what he's saying is, as of right now, So we created the initializer. And then they say, well, let's figure out what the, what the tax, you know, with the tip, what this is going to be. All right. So calculate tip with tip percentage. Well, you take your subtotal. All right. So if your bill was down here, if it was $33 or whatever the heck they say, and, and the percentage is, uh, 15%, then you're going to multiply that by 15. That makes sense. All right. And again, I'm hoping by now the syntax, although it's different, is making a little bit of sense to you. Func, name of the function, in the parentheses as always, the name of the variable and the type of the variable. You don't need a space there, but you can, but I think you can put one in. 
and minus sign greater than sign return type. All right. Again, it's goofy. Every language you know, basically does things in their own way. Swift is foraging some new ground as far as they're not doing everything the same way that Objective-C did it. They're not doing everything the same way that C did it. They're doing things their own way. I was watching a tape today. A Ray Wonderlich has a tape out there. It's just like seven minutes long. That was an intro to this. I can show it to you if you're interested in it. But um, one of the things he said was Swift has been under, it's, it, it's, they've been creating it for over four years now. It literally started somewhere around 2009. All right, the end of 2009, beginning of 2010. So it's been around for a while. All right. So then we're going to call it, and that's what you see right here. All right, where I've got the mouse going back and forth, right down near the bottom of the screen. We're going to call it once with 15%, once with 18%, once with 20%. All right? And when you put something in here, remember this. When you put a uh, backslash and you put something in parens, that means interpolation. That means do whatever is inside of here and then take that result and convert it to a string. So in other words, if we, it, let's say our bill was $100, okay? This is going to come back in here and say 15%, and it'll say $15, because that would be your, that would be a 15% tip on a $100 charge, correct? And then it'll say 18%, $18, 20%, $20. Does that make sense? So then at the very bottom of the screen here, I can't move it up any further because if I do, it goes off into the next page. Now, it, now what we're saying is create a new version of our tip calculator. Our total bill is $33.25, all right? And our tax percentage is 6%. So in other words, our subtotal is going to be 33.25 plus 33.25 times 6%. Does that make sense? All right, so $34, you know, 6% would be about two bucks. So let's just say it's about $35, okay? So if we run this and we call it here, it should come back and say 15%, you know, about $5. 20% or 18% about $6. 20% $7. Does that make sense? All right. And that's what he's telling you to do right here. So this right here is instantiating a new instance of the class, tip calculator. Tip calculator to do its thing needs a total and a tax percentage. We're giving it both. Then once we've created a tip calc, now we can say tip calc dot and we can call the methods. And that's the method, print possible tips. All right. I mean, what he's doing here, it's very straightforward. I'm not saying it 100% makes sense or it doesn't 100% make sense, but it really and truly is straightforward. All right. So he says, uh, here's what the playground file should look like at this point. So let's take a look at this. I don't know if it'll let me do what I want to do here. It's too big. So taking it here from the top. Here's our class. In fact, this is the entire class right here everything. The only thing that's not shown on your screen right now is when they instantiate the class. But this is the whole class. So we've got a class called tip calculator. It has three constants in it. All are doubles. When we initialize it, we pass in. So down at the bottom, right, well, you can't see this. Where they, we just, you just saw it where they passed in $33 and, you know, and whatever. That $33 is this. That 6% tax percentage is this. Does that make sense? Then our subtotal is that. Basically, it's going to end up being your tax plus your uh, your total plus your tax. All right, it'll figure out your, it'll take this and do what I told you before. All right? All right. Then we come down and we're going to call print possible tips. All right? And that's going to come in here. And it's going to return our subtotal times three times. Times 15%, times 18%, and times 20%. He didn't show you what the output, I don't believe he shows you that here, but he does show you on the bottom of the screen here, there's the call to it right there. 
That's what I just shown you previously. All right. Then he comes back and says, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but probably what we should have done is we should have created an array for print possible tips. So for whatever reason, he creates two arrays. All right, and one of those arrays is inferred and one is explicit. I think what he's trying to tell you is you could have done this either way. All right, it really and truly wouldn't have mattered. All right, and he says add these lines. So what he's doing right here is he's putting this inside of a for in loop and what's going to end up happening is you have a little bit less code. That's all. All right. So he's got an array instead of having the three different very you know having the three calls, he's only got one call now. All right. It's in a loop, so it's going to call it all three times. It's going to call it for this one, and it's going to call it for this one, and it's going to call it for this one. All right. And then he still isn't happy. So finally, he comes back and he says, well, the other thing that we could do is in that return possible tips right here, instead of making an array, so it worked without having it be an array, it not, then he made it work with an array, and then he said, let's make it work and let's use a dictionary. Why? Because in this first tutorial, he talked a little bit about arrays and he talked a little bit about dictionaries. So he says, come back in here. And the, the syntax looks a little goofy here. That's how you create a dictionary. The key is of type integer. The value is a double. So for the first one that we pass in, element 0 will be 15, element 1 will be 18, and element 2 will be 20 type of an idea. All right? And those are all percentages. And then notice we got another 4 in in here. All right? And then we come down and we call it and then we return it. Now this one, he does a really good job after this going through there and explaining. So he numbers these and he goes back and number one there is explained right here. Down here is number two, then is number three, etc. So you might want to take a look at that. Now here's my question for you. Is that enough? Is, would you get enough today out of just putting that stuff in, testing it, looking at it, making some changes to it, etc.? Or do you want to start going over the next one? How about you guys? Is what it's what's in here makes sense? Okay, then we'll go on. All right. And it's three forty-five. I'll go till about four o'clock. All right. All right. So when you look here. This will bring up the next tutorial, which is tutorial two. All right, and in tutorial two, among other things, all right, there's what they ask you, to, what the author asks you to do in here. And again, I'm going to show you both of these. This is, you'll have to take my word for it. All right, if you get time between now, don't do it tomorrow. Please don't tell me I ruined your Thanksgiving. But if you've got time before next week, Monday, even if it's an hour before class, this tutorial shows you both ways. If you don't like using the control click like we've been doing and dragging, it shows you both ways of doing it, where you can create outlets and you can create actions without having to do any of that control click or almost none of it. All right. That's what the really is the hallmark of this second tutorial. All right. So if we look here, we've got a view controller now. And we've got our class. And if we look at our class, by and large, this class is exactly the same, pretty much uh, exactly the same as what we had before with the following exceptions. He changed up here. He changed those let's to vars. So he made them variables. All right. Then he's got, look familiar? Get. All right. So that variable, get, and what he's doing is before we were returning this in one of these routines over here. I don't even remember which one. The init pretty much is the same. This pretty much is the same. 
all right? And what's in here, he went back to using his arrays again. All right? But that should work, okay? But what's cool about this example here, I'm going to close this one and bring up the other one. Hopefully, at least, hopefully, some of the stuff in here looks familiar. IB outlet. What's the word after IB outlet? Meaning they're variables, right? There's their name. All right, and I don't know why they've got a space there, but he does. And there's the space afterwards and the type. Look familiar? That's the same stuff we've been talking about. So Swift, in that case, is trying to follow the way Objective-C does things. But what's cool is he shows you how to do this. And he says, you can go in, if you, if you don't like that control click that we've been taught, you know, that we've, we were working with, you don't have to do that. You can just type it in. But then you've got to do some work as far as working with the view controller to set it up. All right, and he does a really good job in there of explaining what he means by that. Maybe I didn't do that good a job of explaining it, but he does a really good job of explaining exactly what he means in there. All right? And again, the only thing that's basically that's new in here is refresh UI. And there's an, it's in down here someplace too. And that's exactly what it's doing, is it's refreshing the interface. All right? Yeah, what that, no, that's a real good question. Mark's question was, this is kind of like the .h, at least somewhat. One thing as far as I can tell, Swift has no .h files. Everything is done, there's no .m either. Everything is done in the .swift file. That's what it looks like. That's what I've, what I've seen so far, all right? The first week that uh, they gave me access to the book that we're gonna be using, I have the first six chapters. I can't share them, believe me. I've been threatened already by them. Don't you let, you know, you can show them in a, on a screen or whatever, but you can't show them to other people, okay? Well, they gave it to me, then all of a sudden, it stopped working. Then it started again, then it stopped again. So finally, I got a hold of their help, and I said, hey, this is ridiculous. And they said, well, it's really weird. Like five years ago, you had an old account set up with us. And somehow, that account was flagged because it hadn't been used in so long. So you started it up again, but then it flagged it, and then for some reason, it let you start it up again, then it flagged it. I'm like, okay, so what did I do wrong? And they said, nothing. Basically, we've upgraded your account, so now I can do it again. And the reason I'm telling you that is now, I've actually got a Swift book I can look at over the weekend. All right? So if there's something in here that I've been telling you that's wrong, ideally by next week, I'll be able to tell you what was wrong. Even that book, from what I understand, that book is going to have a dozen or more chapters. They only have the first six written. So that's all I have, okay? And one of the things I found out, and I guess I can't show you that because it's on the other machine, but if you do go out to the P drive, you know the song and dance, but if you go out to the P drive for the class next semester, and this is already out there, there is a folder that's out there that's called source code. And that's the source code that he's got for his book so far. That's the good news. The bad news is in six chapters, I think chapters one through five are only playgrounds. He doesn't even have complete apps that he's building. All right? Again, a lot of this stuff is just so new. And you could turn around and you could say, okay, I get that, Jeff. But if it's so new, why aren't we just sticking with Objective-C? Because it's a hell of a lot harder. And the idea is eventually this will replace it. So I thought, why not teach you the one that, you know, again, why not teach you short division first as opposed to making you learn long division type of an idea. But if you do go there, there is a folder that's called source code or something like that. It's out there. I haven't even looked at it. I literally just got, got that this morning. So I went and copied it. I haven't gone through it or anything. All right. So I got eight minutes. In these eight minutes, I'm going to quickly try to go over some of the stuff that's in this some of the stuff that's in this uh, second tutorial. All right. 
So if you look up on the screen, the author says, in the first Swift tutorial, you'll learn the basics of Swift and created your own calculator tip class. This is what's new. The reason that he's changing from let to var is what we do in this program is something we have not yet done in, ob in, in Objective-C. All the stuff that we've done so far in Objective-C, we've written all the code basically in line. So in other words, if you have something that you want a button to do, boom, et cetera, that kind of thing. Now what we're going to do is that tip calculator class that we used before, we're going to use that class along with our GUI. So our GUI is going to be able to use stuff from the class. That's how object-oriented programming works. All right. So the author says, you're supposed to come in here, start up a new project now, not a, if you look in here, bottom of page one, not a new playground, but a new project. Single view app like we've been doing. Then he says he wants you to come in and rename your class from tip calculator to tip calculator model and make those changes that I just showed you. You've already got that code, so you don't have to key it in. You want to key it in if that helps you, hey, go for it. All right, but you don't have to do that. All right. He talks a little about the getters and setters. He says, when you're done, this is what your file should look like. This is the one I just showed you. All right. Then he comes in. Well, a lot of this is old hat to you. You might not think it is, but it is. It says here, introdu introduction to storyboards and interface builder. You know what storyboards are because you've used them. You know what interface builder is because you've used that to add controls to your storyboard. So you know what this stuff is. So he talks about what the project navigator is, what the view controller is, etc. Now, I'm making this seem a lot easier than it is because some of the stuff inside of Xcode 6.1, they changed some of the look and feel from the stuff that you've seen earlier. Remember when you had the view controller? And on the bottom of it, you had like that, that yellow triangle, et cetera, you know, all that stuff. I believe they moved all that stuff up to the top. So the look and feel is going to be a little bit different now. The functionality should be identical, all right? But the aesthetic-wise, it's going to look a little bit different. So this is what's cool, I think, about this particular... I would recommend, even if, you, if, if, if all you do today is just that first tutorial and you put that to rest and you don't do anything from here, I'd recommend you do that before starting the second one. It's kind of important with the second one that you read it. They talk about something in the second one that we, we worked on a little bit. Teresa hated it because it was the thing with, with, our, with our bullseye game when you tried to hit, you know, do that stuff for the automatic layout and, the, and you said, I did that stuff and it didn't work. All right, remember that where it had the X and Y coordinates? And this? He wants you to do some of that. When you use that stuff, you're using a, a, a feature that's built into Xcode that's called auto layout, which means that I am telling my, my screen that I want it to be laid out exactly like this. Well, what's nice about doing it like that is if I'm creating an app, and I'm creating an app for, let's say that I create it and I want it to be a tablet app. I don't care if it's not going to run on a phone for whatever reason but it's a tablet app. I can sit there and I can use auto layout and position things exactly where I want them and they'll always be there for my app. You see the advantage of doing that? And I, for example, if it's a game, I can say you need to have, this won't work on a phone. It's just too intricate, wouldn't work on a phone. All right, and only works in landscape. So I can set it up for an iPad landscape and I can automatically lay out things the way I want. Now, if I decide I want to allow portrait, I can automatically lay it out again. If I decide I want the phone, I can lay it out there, too. All right. But what he talks about is how to use auto layout right here. Starting on the bottom of page 5, going on to page 6 here. 
All right. Now he talks about a new thing in, in step seven, if you look up on the screen. Step seven here, I'm on page six. He says, tap gesture recognizer. And he says, from the object library, drag a tap gesture recognizer onto your main view. This will be used to tell when the user taps the view to dismiss the keyboard. Remember where we had that previously, where we, we, we worked with that first responder? Remember that? That's how we got it. Now this is the, considered the more in vogue way to remove the keyboard. All right. And auto layout. Interface Builder can often do a great job setting up reasonable auto layout constraints for you automatically. But there's nothing that beats you doing it yourself. Because when you do it yourself, you have total control over where things are to the pixel. And you know this already because we've talked about this in other classes. In the upper left-hand corner, that's, that's zero, zero, right? So you can, you can position anything right, left, up, down, any way you want to position it. All right? And that's what he's talking about in here. Now, he comes in here and he says, um, so far you've created your, your models and views. It's time to move on to the view controller. He tells you to open this up, and this is the view controller that you get. Looks pretty similar to the view controller that we, we saw earlier when we did our, our own tip calculator. In other words, not a whole heck of a lot in it. I think you'd agree with that. All right. So he comes in and he says, there are some new elements of Swift we haven't learned yet. Let's go over them. So he talks about what the UI kit is. Basically, by importing the UI kit that you see in there like that, that allows you to bring in GUI stuff. All right. I'm just, I'm, I'm just keeping it simple. Okay. All right. Second, he says, this is the first example that you've seen of a class that inherits from another class. In other words, right there, view controller inherits from UI controller. We've seen this before. That isn't new to you. We have looked at that before in other examples. All right. Number three, he says, this method is called with the root view of this first access. When you override a method in Swift, you need to mark it with the word override. Everybody hear that? So you can't just tell it, well, I want to override it. You need that word right there that you see in blue. Anything that you want to override, whether it's something you created up above or something the system created, if you want to override it, you need the word override. All right? Finally, it says, this method is called that last one that's in there when the device is running low on memory. And let's face it, if your device is running low on memory, you're going to know some way or, the, way or another. Okay, what's new here in this, what you see up on your screen right now, is he tells you, all right, he tells you, he says, add these following properties. He tells you to type them in manually. Then he tells you how to go back in after that, okay? He goes back in and he tells you how to do this without the control click. Then he comes in, a, in one of these gray boxes that you saw, and he says, but there's another way of doing it, and that's the control click way. What I'd suggest is you do it the way that they mention it right here. All right? The way that he's got it here on page 8. Tr when you get to that point, you're going to have time next week to do this. All right? But I'd suggest you do that. Then, after you've done that, I would suggest removing everything that you just created. Just get rid of it. Then go back and do it the old way with the control click. Do it both ways because then you can figure out, I like it this way or I like it this way. I mean, if you wanted to, I could do one this way, then one with a control click, then another one, et cetera. I don't know why you do that, but, it, but you could. All right? I'll tell you real quickly, maybe I've told you about this already, but when I was at AT&T, there were two Unix editors that everybody used. Actually, there were three. One was Ed, which was the dumbest. It, it, it was actually dumber than Notepad. Not Notepad++, than Notepad, okay? But some people used it. Then there was another one called VI, all right, which I think stood for Visual Interface, and there was another one that was called Emacs. Okay, the reason I'm telling you this is they all worked. 
I knew one guy who used Ed because he never learned how to type. He was a two-fingered typist, and he used Ed for everything. He'd been there for years. Okay. I used Emacs. I found the command set on it easier. There was only one person I knew while I was working there. Her name is Marlene Barron. That she had a, a smart a, a, a mind, like they say, like a steel trap. She could switch back and forth between the two editors while she was working. Now, if Mike tells me, oh, I'm using Unix and I use them both, I believe him. But the point is, most people find a way of doing something and a comfort level that they have in doing it, and that's the one they stick with. So what I'm saying is here is try it this way, then remove it and try it the other way and see which one you're more comfortable with. Because this is what he asks you to do here. He says manually go in and type in these four things, all right, that you see right here eventually in blue, okay? Now, do you notice something that looks a little funny about these? Anybody? There's an exclamation point on all of them, okay? It's not a mistake, and it means something, just so you know. This is going to sound maybe goofy, but the opposite of an exclamation point is a question mark. When you've got an exclamation point there, what it says is you're telling the system, I can assure you there will be a value in there. Did you hear what I said? So if there isn't a value in there, what do you think happens? It's more than that. The program's going to blow up right there. Okay? If you're not sure whether or not there'll be a value in there, you can put a question mark, which means that that is optional. All right? And what it does in here, they mention in here, it does, I think it's what it's called, it's, it does an explicit unwrapping. I think that's the term that they use for it. All right? But if you're sure, and you might say, well, that's fine. You know what? I'm just hell with it. I'm not going to put anything there. And it may not matter now, but when you go to run the program, if you don't have one of those in there or the other on some of your programs now, they're, the program will blow up. And it, it's doing that because, again, this is a type safe language. And it's telling you, hey, you might have a problem with this. So it's not even putting you in the situation where you can have a problem with it. So they tell you to do this, and then they tell you, they explain exactly what these variables are. Oh, I guess it's implicitly unwrapping them with the exclamation point. All right? All right. And then he says, come on. He says, after we get done with this, let's connect our actions. Okay? So he says in here, well, when we connect our actions, let's just start typing these things in ourselves. So literally, we'll just type in at sign, IB action, func, calculate, tapped, etc. The stuff you see right there. You see it. All right? But then when you look after this, so I'm, I'm turning up to page 10. Oh, I guess page 9, sorry. And the author says, hey, guess what? There's an even easier way to do this. This is the control click. See what I'm saying? So he shows you both ways of doing it. So what I would like to do is, it is it's after four now, but just stop now. And then next week, if I can get another version on here in this machine that'll work, then do it both ways in front of you. And, but hopefully by that time, you will have read this, and you go, oh, so I can do it this way or this way. It does the same thing. Well, I like this way better. Then do it that way. Well, I like the other way better. Then do it that way. I wouldn't recommend, if you've got 800 ways to do something, just keep trying to learn all 800 ways. You know? No, yeah, learn the one you're comfortable with, that type of thing. All right? Back when I started teaching Java, and you looked at the Java API, it wasn't that big. And I had a student who told me they were going to memorize everything. Try doing that now when there are thousands of things in the API. Nobody's that good. No. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, what, yeah, what I'm telling you is what I'd like you to do for the rest of the class then is to come in 
And whether you type in some of that code yourself or drop it in or whatever, but go and bring up a playground file and bring in all the stuff from the first, the, 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 from the, the first uh, tutorial. What's that? Oh, okay. But you can make changes too. You know, you know how to make changes, right? So in other words, you can, you can, no, not even that. But if you got that to work, let's just say you get it to work in 10 or 15 minutes. Well, then go in and make checks, make checks so you can't, you know, that says something like if you put in a negative number or if you put in a negative percentage, don't allow it. See what I'm saying? So you can add if statements in there. You can add some logic. There's not much logic in there right now. All right, so I'm going to give you time to do that. All right, and that's, like I said, I'm done. Now, this is going to be interesting.